Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Lund University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope your 2023 is off to a good start and wishing you all the best for this year of the rabbit. I think that the podcast is off to a good start because this interview has kind of fundamentally changed my thinking about social media and politics. And what I mean by that is there's a general trend, I think, among academics working in this space to think that the social media campaigning is not as sophisticated as we might have thought based on claims from you know, Cambridge Analytica, for example. And I think that's true to an extent. But what I really learned in this interview is that social media is really only a fraction of where the digital political advertising is. Increasingly, it's moving to connected televisions, you know, smart TVs, and streaming services, and also, of course, YouTube and pre-roll ads and things like that. And even if we're studying the advertising coming from a candidate's social media page, as we'll find out in this interview, that campaigns are launching advertisements from multiple accounts they create in order to spread their message and, and sort of work around the Facebook algorithm. So I do think that especially at the top of American campaigns, they are highly complex, but we really can't draw much inference about what's happening from social media. So. I just wanted to start with that before introducing my guest, Megan Clausen. She is a partner at Gambit Strategies, which is a digital advertising firm working on political messages aimed at persuasion and mobilization. And we'll talk more about that in the interview. Megan has a really interesting background. She comes from the brand advertising space, working for ad agencies in New York City, particularly with uh, Samsung and AT&T and moved from there directly into a lead role for Hillary Clinton's campaign and later was a paid media advisor to Joe Biden's campaign. She's worked on a number of other campaigns up and down ballot, notably J.B. Pritzer, the governor for Illinois, uh, where she won a lot of awards for that campaign. So Megan really knows her stuff. And this interview gets pretty technical in terms of the jargon and terms used like CTV, meaning connected TV, OTT, over the top advertising. If you want to learn more about those concepts, you can dial back to episode 74 with Adam Mel where we broke down what OTT is. But if you don't know a term, maybe Google it and try to catch up so it makes more sense because it really is worth understanding all the things that Megan is saying in this interview. I learned so much about things like, you know, political ads competing with brands on Hulu and Roku and these various uh, streaming services. Also, how things like the timing of payments matters. Maybe the campaign buys some inventory in the future, but then doesn't meet their fundraising goals. You know, what does that mean for political advertising? So really interesting conversation and really provides a back end glimpse into the challenge and the complexity of these American campaigns and the modern digital campaigning ecosystem. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Megan Clausen. Again, she is a partner at Gambit Strategies. Megan, thanks for taking the time out and welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me today. So why don't we start out here by introducing our listeners to Gambit Strategies. Your agency specializes in digital programs for political persuasion and mobilization. So to get us acquainted with your work, can you give us an overview of what running these digital programs entails day to day, as well as your approach to running them? Yeah, yeah, of course. So Gambit you know, specializes in persuasion and mobilization or, you know, what some people call GOTV, um, as you mentioned. So we don't actually do fundraising. And that is because we fundamentally think that fundraising is a different skill set than persuasion and mobilization advertising. We uh, joke sometimes in our pitches that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want your fundraiser writing your TV ad. So your digital fundraiser should also not be writing your broad scale persuasion ad for digital. And I would say, you know, our day to day varies a lot. We work really closely with campaigns and organizations. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, after the election cycle, like right now, it's much slower and we're in more of a business development period. But, you know, as we start to 
kick off the next election cycle. We will work closely with different campaigns and organizations talking about their long term strategy, you know, setting digital advertising budget goals, um, having strategic conversations about things like when we launch campaigns, what our messaging is, if we're going to do, you know, specific message ad testing early on, um, all of those types of things. And then, you know, obviously, as we launch campaigns, it's going to change a little bit in terms of what we're doing. We're going to be monitoring campaigns closely, uh, you know, doing reporting, optimization, swapping creative as needed. And of course, because it's politics, there's always rapid response elements where, you know, if something happens in the news or our opponent says something particularly negative, we might talk about whether we respond to that with a paid advertising effort online. But I do think overall, one thing that differentiates Gambit a little bit from some of the other firms in the space is that as a digital firm, we've kind of set ourselves up more like how you'd consider a small TV firm is set up in that um, myself and my partner, Patrick McHugh, get very uh, involved early on in campaigns. We get involved in the higher level strategy discussions with the clients we work with. And, you know, in order to have that kind of involvement, we take on a limited number of clients because both of us want to be integrated in every you know, clients that, that we work with. So I think that's really important piece because given how much voters media habits have shifted, even over the past four to six years to digital, I think it's important to have people who understand that landscape when you're having those kind of discussions now. Absolutely. Which is why it's great to have a, a campaigner like yourself, you know, that we can check in with every now and then to see, you know, what is changing in this environment because it's moving so quickly. And so I wanted to ask you particularly about this distinction between persuasion and mobilization. At a general level, is there a huge difference in designing programs for persuasion versus mobilization? Or is the basic approach and skills needed relatively similar? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think if you'd asked that question, you know, four to six years ago, people might have argued that these are completely different goals. You know, with persuasion, you're trying to target people who are very likely to turn out in an election, but might not be with your candidate or cause. Whereas with mobilization, in theory, you're trying to target people who are already with the candidate or cause, but you know, maybe are less likely to turn out. So you're kind of trying to push them to turn out to vote. But I think, you know, in the last couple of years, people have recognized that you could actually leave a lot of votes on the table by only telling mobilization targets to go vote when it's time to vote. And we actually need to sort of run this persuasion campaign to mobilization targets earlier on so that they have a reason to go vote when it becomes that time. So I think you could argue that these campaigns have gotten really similar, especially earlier on in races. But then, you know, there's still going to be that push that's more action oriented with with mobilization targets where maybe you're trying to drive people to look up their polling place and take that action online or drive them to maybe request a vote by mail ballot. And, you know, those goals are a little bit different because when we consider our persuasion campaigns, we're typically looking at reaching people and reaching them enough times with the right message to change their mind. Whereas, you know, some of these GOTV campaigns can be a little bit more action driven. And I would also add that oftentimes mobilization targets tend to be younger or tend to be more diverse. So even if we're using very similar tactics to run these campaigns, we also are, you know, considering who we're talking to and how those tactics should should vary strategically, both in terms of like ad placement and and message to make sure that we're talking to these targets effectively since they can be very different than our typical persuasion targets. Yeah, interesting. And I'd like to circle back to something you said before about Gambit not doing fundraising because that's a, a sort of a different uh, skill set, basically, or maybe not skill set is the right word, but a different competency. And I'm interested in that because as academics, when we're kind of coding these campaign posts, we often include fundraising as part of mobilization. And so I'm wondering. You know, let's say a campaign would like to run a fundraising campaign on digital. How would that kind of work with, you know, your strategies? Because I could imagine that if you have a candidate that's going out and asking, let's say, a mobilization target for money, might there be an element of fatigue or might you oversaturate that target with a certain amount of messaging? So how do you sort of work these different parts of digital between your agency and another group that might be working on the uh, fundraising side on digital? Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, I think being able to work together, work closely together is really important so that we understand, you know, who our 
fundraising teams talking to you versus who we're talking to. But I would say like a lot of times when you are running fundraising campaigns online, obviously we do not do this, but I have previously run digital fundraising campaigns for Hillary Clinton's campaign, for example. You're sort of trying to narrow in on people who are really likely to donate or drive low cost per signups to a list and then ultimately convert that person to a donor over time. So you might be you know, using list targeting, you might be doing lookalikes of people who are already on your list to find similar individuals who could be likely to donate online. But even though mobilization targets are likely to, you know, be with a candidate or cause, I don't think that that necessarily makes them a likely donor. You know, for example, we might target all black voters of a certain age group as mobilization targets, and you would never target that widely for a fundraising campaign because, you know, you're very much trying to drive ROI in the long term. So if you cast such a wide net, it's going to be really hard to pay that back um, over time. So fundraising is definitely a more narrow, you know, and niche targeting segment than say like a broader GOTV effort. But that being said, I agree with you. I think, you know, as you get closer to the time when you might be communicating with mobilization targets, it's really important to have communication across teams as to who's targeting ads where, you know, for example, one big example that comes up a lot during the campaign cycle is when should we switch Google search from fundraising to GOTV um, or, you know, persuasion in theory, basically driving people to information about a candidate instead of driving them to ask to give money because Google search is actually a pretty big fundraising driver for most campaigns, uh, you know, because you're reaching people who are already seeking out that candidate. So that can always be a really hard thing to figure out because on one hand, you know, when people have ballots in hand and maybe are searching, you know, a candidate's name, you want to be driving them to positive information and make sure they're not seeing negative information from your competitor. But on the other hand, you know, you don't want to be giving up too much money that you could be using for additional communication. So it's definitely um, a push and pull and important to be having those conversations constantly. Yeah, it's super interesting how fragmented this digital strategy has become even over the past uh, 10 years or so. So we've heard recently on the podcast that campaigns tend to be most protective of their television budget first. And we've heard sort of reasons for why that is, because it can still talk to a large number of voters, particularly voters who are older, um, also in the sort of mindset that they're in when they're watching television, sort of sitting down, which may be also because uh, they tend to be older. And so I'm just curious how you see digital programs sort of relationship to the traditional television advertising. Is television still king? And then how does digital relate to that? <laughs> I love this question. And um, I think I actually, you know, a long time ago came from the brand advertising side. So I think I particularly get frustrated with how slow uh, we've been to move on shifting dollars to uh, to digital advertising from TV, just because the brand side made that transition much quicker than we did on the political side. So it's frustrating. But I think, you know, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of having a, you know, a better evaluation process for how you should spend paid media dollars. I think that we've come a long way in the last, you know, four years or so, the last couple cycles. But in my opinion, I think when you're putting together a paid media budget, you should really be taking into account where the voters you're targeting are spending the most time. So, and I think there's sort of this misconception that old voters are not online, but the reality is that, you know, people... 65 and below have been cutting the cord in droves, especially since the pandemic. So while maybe like, you know, when you get to people over 65, you could probably argue that they still watch cable television more than anything else. I think most other voters are really transitioning to either a mix or transitioning to streaming only. Um, we see across the board when we look at competitive DMAs that, you know, using set top box data, so actual data, not survey data that about 40% plus of voters in any given DMA are not watching traditional TV at all anymore. And about 20% are light TV viewers, meaning that they might have a cable subscription, but they're turning it on to watch live sports or the Emmys or something of that nature. They're not like going and turning on their TV and watching what's on live every single night, um, which makes it really hard to reach those people and reach them enough times to change their mind. And I think the other confusing piece is like, where the line is drawn right now. For example, 
there's usually a lot of discussion in the early days of uh, hiring firms as to like whether the TV firm is going to place the CTV and OTT piece or if the digital firm is going to place that piece of the buy. And I think this makes it really confusing for decision makers in the paid media process because that does make a big difference. Like, you know, if we're executing the CTV versus if a TV team is executing the CTV, that should make a major difference in how the budget is allocated between those two firms because that should be an enormous part of your, you know, your budget. But I don't really think we're taking that into account. We're sort of viewing it as like TV budget or digital budget, regardless of where the line is drawn, which uh, isn't, in my opinion, the best way, you know, to figure that split out. And I do want to plug that we are big believers that digital teams should handle CTV and OTT. um, Because I think the tough part is when when TV firms handle it, they just don't necessarily have Most of them don't have a media team in house that is actually doing the buy. So it means that they're outsourcing it. It becomes this very secondary thing to them that they don't necessarily put as much attention to the details on. And they also don't tag track and optimize it, meaning that they have no idea if, you know, voters are hearing our ad way too much on Hulu and not enough times on Roku or something. There's no there's no actual optimization in real time. And we've seen actually, even this cycle, a lot of frustration with clients that decided to have their TV firm <laughs> execute instead of us, you know, a lot of questions and why aren't we seeing the ad? Why is it playing a million times in a row on this channel, but I'm not seeing it at all on this ad vendor. So um, I do think it's important to make sure that you are using people who have the expertise to execute those buys, because that is really where you know, we can actually reach a lot of voters now. So it's a really big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, that, that's a super interesting um, sort of dynamic I hadn't thought of between the kind of, yeah, where does the OTT budget go? Does it go to the digital people or to the TV people? And you've talked previously about this idea of like sitting at the table. And I know it's something that uh, is mentioned on Gambit's website as well, is that you have, you know, a pollster and, and, you know, a few key players in the campaign sort of with the candidate deciding the strategy in terms of advertising, messaging, and other things. And so I'm just wondering, in in your experience, um, or have you heard of experiences where these tensions get a bit fraught between the digital team and the TV team? I mean, is is, is this a big point of contention? Because this is where, I guess, you're both fighting over the same kind of pot of money, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's usually something that's honestly decided upon when at the point of hiring, you know? So it's not something that I think comes up a lot during the campaign cycle, unless there's a specific issue, you know, Mm. there have been times where we have not executed it, like I mentioned, and have had managers come to us with questions, uh, because they don't feel like their TV firm can answer the questions. So that, you know, kind of puts us in an awkward position in some ways, because we're like, okay, you didn't want to pay us to do this, but now you want us to do it. (laughs) But I think overall, to me, it's like, in my opinion, whoever is going to be placing that piece of the buy, whoever wants to do it can do it. But I just think there needs to be some level of, you know, quality that needs to be established and, you know, some parameters. If, if you want to place the buy, you have to tag, track, optimize and report on it, for example, at the bare minimum. So I think that piece just needs to be resolved earlier on or negotiated. But The thing is that a lot of times when we honestly get brought on to pitch campaigns, the media team, TV team's already been hired. So sometimes there's not even the opportunity to to make that case for digital firms because we aren't necessarily the first consultant being hired on any given campaign. And again, I think it's equal opportunity for anyone who has the skill set to do it. I just worry that we aren't putting uh, enough thought into, you know, making sure that people are doing it correctly, because I do think that you know, we're leaving a lot out on the field if we aren't executing this piece uh, well. Yeah. And I mean, I know we're we're derailing a bit from from some of the topics that I I wanted to talk about, but I'm curious about these media buys because it's not something I know so much about. And I don't think uh, our listeners know so much about it either. And I'm just curious when it comes to the budgeting, I mean, how can you forecast how much these Um, these media buys are going to cost. I mean, from what I kind of understand, it's kind of a a floating market and there's going to be a difference, you know, based on different platforms, different times of day. So how could you sort of, as you're saying, it's sort of negotiated beforehand, but how could you sort of make these projections about what these ads will cost on different digital platforms? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we We have some sense of, you know, every ad vendor's CPM, which means cost per thousand impressions. So when we're projecting long-term budgets, oftentimes we're taking some kind of hybrid 
CPM, you know, thinking through like, okay, if we, if we think we're going to spend say 20% of our budget on social media and, you know, 60% on premium video and, you know, X percent on audio and display, how can we, you know, kind of pull together a hybrid CPM and then we do it based on audiences. So of course, a lot is going to change through the course of a campaign. So you don't necessarily know on day one who your targets are, but I think having some sense of who we think persuadable voters are, for example, in a district or a state and being able to see how many people we can reach online as a whole. Like if we want to reach people, say, five times per week across all platforms um, within a given audience, being able to estimate an average cost for doing that per week, that's kind of how we think about it. We think about what is the minimum amount of times we think we need to reach people across platforms and then speculating out what, what a hybrid CPM would be across channels that we might invest in. Um, so that would be like the early days of, of budget estimation. But then when we get closer to the point of execution, you know, that's when we put together a more detailed media plan that actually breaks down how much we're spending on every platform, what that's going to cost, how many impressions we're getting on each platform per week, all of those details. And the other piece that I think sometimes gets lost, especially if you don't have an in-house media team who's working on this stuff is, is being able to reserve premium inventory in advance. You know, if, if you're buying everything through the, the live bidding auction market programmatically, there's not going to be a lot of premium inventory available in that final four weeks leading into the election because it just becomes so competitive. And also a lot of elections, you know, are in November, which is also Q3, Q4 timing for brands. So we're not only competing among, you know, other candidates or causes. We're also competing with basically the brand advertising world for these very premium ad impressions, force view video. So making sure that you actually go ahead and reserve inventory far out in advance so it doesn't sell out. For example, like a lot of times Hulu will sell out for Q3, Q4 by like May or June. Um, so if you aren't going through and doing that part of the process, you're not going to have as strong of a media buy ultimately when you get to the point where it's most critical. Wow, that's crazy to think about. So, I mean, do you think that has implications for, I mean, obviously campaigns with bigger budgets would be able to buy up more of that premium inventory. Um, might this be a sort of disadvantage for, let's say, a, a smaller campaign, a sort of challenger campaign? Does this sort of buying up that premium inventory right before crossing the finish line, do you notice that being a, a significant advantage for incumbent or well-resourced campaigns? Um, I think it's probably an advantage for well-resourced campaigns, but not for the reason you think. I think that um, a lot of times, you know, booking inventory, we don't have to prepay until like a week or a couple of weeks before. So if we're reserving like a Hulu buy in October, we might not have to pay for that till like mid to end of September. So in theory, like we don't need the money that much sooner if we do the reservations. But I do think like oftentimes down ballot races or races that have less resources aren't necessarily able to hire maybe a digital firm early on, or maybe they don't even have a, a large enough paid media budget to justify hiring multiple firms, things of that nature might contribute to them not having as strong of a, a reservations process. But we booked reservations last cycle, for example, for races up and down the ballot, you know, congressional races, statewide races, even races that were below the congressional level um, and didn't have any big issues. But we are actually seeing that vendors are pushing more and more to prepay them earlier for these sort of buys, because I think that they get nervous that, you know, things shift during the election and there's cancellations at certain points because either the candidate or organization doesn't fundraise as much as they previously thought they would, or maybe money's shifting from digital to something else. So they have been, uh, I would say, over the last couple of cycles pushing for prepayment earlier than they previously did. Basically, we didn't used to have to pay until the week that the inventory was running. And now it's kind of pushed back. You know, we want to be paid a week or two in advance. Some vendors this cycle tried to argue for like months in advance, and we were able to negotiate not doing that. But it'll be interesting to see how the industry continues to shift as, you know, the more that I think people are viewing digital as the most critical part of their ad campaigns, the more leverage it gives these ad vendors overall to kind of push for these more strict restrictions on when when payments have to be made. 
right? And then I guess, of course, if you're competing with corporate brands, they're probably much more positioned to give that money in advance because exactly. you know, they're, <laughs> they're working on a different, uh, different speed. Exactly. Especially because a lot of those deals on the corporate brand side are negotiated at like a very high, like agency level, for example, like publicists will do an upfront with Hulu. <laughs> we can't exactly compete with that kind of process. Right. I th- I'd argue it's better for voters to see messages from candidates rather than M&Ms or, uh, or McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so going back to this idea of, of sort of television and versus digital ads, I mean, one of the arguments that, that television is still a better persuasive medium, which I'm, I'm just sort of spitting out the common wisdom here is that because it's longer form, uh, people can't skip it. And, you know, I've I've read about you talking about this idea of forced view ads in in a previous interview. And I thought your perspective on that was really interesting, especially when it comes to sound and the production process more generally behind producing a a forced view ad, one that's non-skippable versus one that you can kind of skip to get on to uh, to your content. So can you outline how designing a digital ad might differ based on whether it's slated to be forced view or not, as well as why that might matter from the viewer's perspective? Yeah, it's it's really important. And there are tons of nuances by every platform and partner online as to how the ads serve. I think to me, the most important pieces are is the ad force viewer and are skippable, as you just mentioned. I think that's probably the most critical of all. But then also what device is the ad primarily serving on? Um, you know, very different if it's serving on CTV versus a mobile device versus like a desktop device primarily. And also if the sound is going to be on automatically or if somebody has to click something to turn the sound on. Um, just to give an example, like think about the difference between you know, a Hulu ad and connected TV, which you're basically just viewing a TV ad in the the viewer's mind, right? Versus an ad on YouTube, which, you know, YouTube ads primarily get served on mobile devices. So even though you can buy force view ad impressions on YouTube, they still primarily can serve on a mobile device. And then last, like a Facebook or Instagram ad where you're literally just scrolling through a feed and have to choose to stop to look at something if if you want to look at it. Those are very different ad experiences. So for us, I think it's really, really important, you know, to develop content that fits any of these platforms. And our approach overall is like if we're developing a 15 second ad, because our, you know, our clients aren't aren't necessarily going to have resources to produce 10 different versions of this 15 second ad (laughs) so that whether it serves on a CTV device or a mobile device, that it's going to be entirely different. We sort of approach it as like, how can we make sure that this 15 second ad could be understood regardless of the circumstances where it's going to serve? It could be understood on a connected TV where the sound's on. It can be understood on a mobile device. You know, it can be understood without sound. So that means that we're oftentimes have bigger text on screen. We're making sure that the entire ad can be understood without sound if it is played without sound. So I think, you know, that's really important. And then I think making sure that you're Thinking through social media, to, social media to me is almost a completely separate piece just because, you know, people are only looking at something for about three to five seconds on average, which is a really short attention span. So with social media, you know, a lot of times we're thinking about static images that we can use to get a simple message across or animated GIFs. Um, or the third option is trying to produce something that really draws somebody in and makes them stop. Because otherwise, people are just going to scroll right past your content and running like a 30 second ad on Facebook is really just literally a waste of money because they're never going to get the message that you're intending them to get. And I think like one thing to say from my side is that I also kind of have maybe a somewhat controversial opinion that all ads are skippable. It's just that some can't be measured. Like I think realistically, most people are not sitting in front of their TV watching the screen as the ads come on um, live TV. At best, I think they're looking at their phone. At worst, they're getting up and leaving the room. Um, And I actually think that we should be thinking about how can we, using some of these digital practices that we've used to grab people's attention or get a message early in an ad, I think we should think about how we can incorporate some of those approaches into TV ads, given that people's attention spans across the board are very short now. And they're, you know, a lot of times they are not going to watch the TV ad because they have their mobile device in their hand. They're just going to turn to their mobile device. So I think we need to think about how can we draw people into our TV ads better 
or otherwise, you know, we better be shifting more investment to those mobile ads because <laughs> that's where people's attention is going to be going. Yeah. Or even like, I think for, for, for me, the example would be if a Spotify ad comes up, you can just turn down the sound for 30 seconds, do something else, and then come back to the platform. Exactly. We need to be realistic about like what people actually are doing when they hear our ads. So, you know, I think talking to you, I really get a sense of like the, the compl- and this is only the tip of the iceberg, I'm sure, but the complexity of this, this advertising ecosystem. And, you know, I wanted to ask you kind of just point blank, because as academics, like right now, the trending thing is to analyze, you know, Facebook and Instagram ads, because we have this ad library. And, and this is sort of, we're trying to glean insights from that. And I know we'll get to some aspects on why that's, that's problematic, but thinking about the whole ecosystem, what percentage of advertising is these Facebook and Instagram ads, given the fact that people can scroll past them or, or whatever? I mean, is that kind of where the, the persuasion and mobilization is? It doesn't quite sound like it. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think it depends on a lot of factors in my mind. Um, I think the biggest ones are audience, like who are we targeting and where are they most reachable? And also budget. You know, if you have, for example, a down ballot race that has a $20,000 budget uh, for their whole digital budget or something, you probably aren't going to be producing a 15 second ad and running ads on Hulu. So like, a lot of times, you know, depending on the ads budget, sometimes social media is just the easiest option, both in terms of production budget, but also like accessibility and targeting. You know, they have very strong targeting where we can narrow in an audience more effectively if the budget's more limited. And I also think social media lends itself to getting information out there early on in a campaign because, you know, it does cost a little bit less and people are spending a lot of time there and getting their news and information there. But that being said, you know, if you have the budget to run a larger scale persuasion campaign, I do not think social media should be a huge portion of your investment. I think that we need to have ads there, both because people are spending so much time there, but also because, like I mentioned before, so many people are getting actual news and information from social media now. And, you know, coupled with the fact that there's so much negative and fake information on social media I think being there to sort of combat that and and reach people where they are. But I think that in terms of effectiveness and persuasion value, force view video is definitely the best place, to, you know, to place your first dollar just because, you know, people are seeing and hearing your message. I also think when it comes to persuading someone to vote one way or another, there's like this emotional aspect to it. And I think it's really hard to drive emotion without sound, if that makes sense. So like being able to actually get even 15 seconds is kind of a short time period to get a a message in front of someone, but being able to use 15 seconds or 30 seconds to, to reach somebody with a critical message versus, you know, having some no sound social media posts that they scroll right past definitely has a higher persuasion value um, to me than, you know, so I think overall social media should be much lower investment. It should depend on who you're targeting and how much money you have. But I would say like on average, if I had to pick a percentage, probably like about 15 to 20% of the budget would be typical in the campaigns that we execute. Okay. So yeah, this is uh, (laughs) interesting for us to know as academics, as we try to say that, you know, I I think there's an implicit bias where we say, you know, this is what these candidates are advertising. But I mean, yeah, I think 15, 20%, maybe we need to be more cautious about the how we're approaching these things, which leads me to my next question, because in reading some of the previous interviews that you've done, uh, this is something I didn't know about, which is like we've talked about on the show how campaigns, particularly the the Biden campaign, had been partnering with influencers and sort of forging these digital partnerships and really sort of pioneering that strategy. But something I hadn't heard about was campaigns creating accounts on social media that mimic brands or news organizations as a way to launch the ads from. So sort of launching ads from accounts different from that of the actual candidate themselves. And I think that's smart because on the one hand, we know that the perceived source of a message is really important. Like like voters take that into account when they are viewing an ad because it sort of triggers their, their cognitive bias if it's coming from a candidate on the left or right. And so I'm curious if you could tell us a bit about that strategy. And then I wonder, I mean, isn't it a bit misleading to sort of create an account and then launch ads from that rather than just having something coming directly from the campaign itself? Yeah. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I think uh, 
you know, with those of us who are creating these separate pages to, to launch ads, the intention is not, you know, to mislead people, but, you know, more so to give people an opportunity to see our message, you know, maybe without the direct partisan association that they might have when they see a candidate's name directly next to it. Um, you know, if somebody sees Joe Biden or Donald Trump on their feed, most people are going to have a very strong opinion of those two individuals and either scroll right past or stop and view it. And you're probably not reaching the people that you really want to be talking to. Obviously, those are very high level examples. But like, even when it comes to a lot of the statewide races, I think people get very, you know, very swayed by their partisan background. So, you know, allowing people to sort of give the content a chance, I think is is really important. And, you know, maybe if it's coming from a page called Iowa Daily instead of Joe Biden, people might stop and read the information. But I would add, you know, just a caveat that this argument only stands true if the information being presented is entirely factual. If you're using these pages to put out false information or fake information, that is, a, of course, a completely different story and not something that I think our party is engaging in actively, uh, at least to my knowledge. Um, a lot of times, honestly, when I have done this for candidates, we use it as a way to just push out positive news information in a strategy we've been calling news boosting. So like, you know, given the amount of people that have moved away from reading local news, um, we we want to sort of get that information in front of them from reputable sources. So we literally just take a news article and turn it into an ad by posting it on social media and boosting it from these pages. So it's completely factual information. It's just coming out from a different page rather than the candidate's page alone, um, which I think is a great way to be able to make sure that people are seeing positive news coverage that they might not otherwise be reading. And then the other thing to just consider with these pages and, and their use case is that Facebook's algorithm also, you know, is, is choosing on the back end what content people see, which includes paid ads to some extent. So if you're using only a candidate's page, there's a chance that you're actually excluding voters, you know, because you aren't running ads from alternative pages just because of the way that Facebook's algorithm is deciding who should and shouldn't see your ad on the back end, which is a, a black box that we don't truly understand. So a lot of times we do see, we've seen use cases, for example, where running from multiple pages at once instead of just one page, even if those pages are actually called something similar, like in, in 2020, we had a bunch of different Facebook pages that were called like Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, Joe Biden for president. So like not even using news organization related pages, but just a variety of pages that were tied to him. And we saw increased reach by using many pages instead of one page, just because of how Facebook is, you know, evaluating these pages and choosing who's going to see their ads. So there's also sort of a strategic imperative if you're trying to reach as many people as possible really quickly. Um, though, I will add that there's also the downside of doing that is that you could be bidding against yourself then. Right, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to ask. You're driving up uh, the cost of each impression. So it's sort of like a, it's something that I think I would only really recommend doing if you're in, in the final week or two of the election and you're like, we just need to reach all these voters as many times as possible and make sure that we're actually reaching as many people as possible and just know that you might be paying an increased cost in order to do so and you're sort of going to have to evaluate whether that increased cost is worth it for the increased reach. Right. So creating competition against yourself. Yeah, exactly. Which isn't typically recommended, but, you know, in very specific time periods, it might be allowable. <laughs> and then I would also just touch on, since you brought up influencers, um, which is a different piece. Um, I think there's like sort of been this discussion about what role influencers have in, in political ads for a really long time. And I think it's just hard to me to justify it from like, especially in a non-presidential environment. Like I know Joe Biden's campaign, we were able to use influencers uh, really well, but that was because a bunch of influencers agreed to, to post content on a non-paid basis. So we weren't paying them for ads. They were sort of volunteering their time to be able to post on our behalf. And I think paying influencers to post content gets really tricky because number one, there's sort of the the question of like, is there a negative effect when it, someone knows that somebody is posting on your behalf just because they're getting paid to? Because a lot, you know, you have to have that hashtag sponsored, which I think a lot of voters who would be most influenced by this content understand that this is an ad. 
And then I think the second piece is like, you know, again, with Facebook's algorithm, they're not showing content to every single person who follows every page when they post it. They're picking and choosing based on who has been interacting with that influencer's content on a regular basis, who likes to engage with political content. They deprioritize political content for people who don't engage with political content. So I think it's just hard to me to justify spending money on a social media post that may or may not be seen by anyone that we need to reach when we could be using those resources to reach people that we know we want to be talking to, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think from from what we've heard on this podcast is that, you know, in some cases, it's not that the influencers are actually expecting to be paid. It's actually that they want access. They want yeah. to meet, they want to meet the candidate. They want to meet the principals. They want to get invites to exclusive stuff because that's kind of what they get from brands. Yeah, that's true as well. That's also an option. Um, but of course you have to take into account then that the candidate's time and <laughs> schedule. Yeah. How do you, how do you guarantee a meeting with Joe Biden, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a couple last questions for you here. One is that I, I wanted to ask you about, um, and you know, we've talked about how, how social media may be a, a small slice of a, of a large budget campaign, but the relationship between digital advertising and organic posts. And again, this is a sort of interest coming from academia that we tend to study one or the other. And I'm just curious to hear, I mean, are these part of an integrated strategy? I mean, clearly organic posts are going to people who already like the candidate or are following the page, show interest, whereas I guess digital advertising is more to reach people who are not following the page. But I mean, is there sort of a, does there need to be a sort of integrated character of the, or message from the candidate across these channels or are they relatively distinct? Yeah. Um, I do think what you hit on there about the audience is is really the most important thing to consider. I think the audience of people who follow candidates on social media tends to be very insidery and obviously lean very strongly one way or the other, depending on who they're following. So the type of content that performs well, you know, with that that type of audience is not necessarily the type of thing that's going to perform well with a persuasion audience, because uh, they, you know, tend to be more in the middle, um, undecided, a lot, a lot of times more moderate in nature. And then I think also like, what is organic performance? And what does that really indicate? Because a lot of times what performs well, you know, these days, especially on social media is stuff that is surprising or shocking, which tends to be pretty partisan content that's causing people to like react, comment, share. And this is not the type of content that, you know, is going to move people across party lines or convince someone to vote one way or the other who's on the fence. So I think we have to be careful about assuming that strong performance organically means that we should use something for advertising. But I do think that if there's a really strong piece of content that uh, we post on organic social. It's worth definitely worth testing if you're running an ad test, for example, being able to test and see if that's something that could be used for persuasion content. Um, and then I think the second piece is I think that there's room to consider whether certain uh, messages play well with like mobilization targets, for example, or for fundraising is probably an even better example. If you're seeing something really pop, you know, being able to put it in front of audiences that are more similar to your organic audience, you know, that skew more left to begin with um, could be an option. But again, I think with GOTV targets, it's still important to test and measure, especially because a lot of times, you know, when it comes to mobilization targets, we're splitting those into buckets. Like we might have a track targeting young people. We might have a track that's meant to get out black voters, a track that's meant to turn out Latino voters. And, you know, all of those audiences alone have their own nuances. So making sure that um, what's working well in organic is really going to resonate with those audiences as well is really important. Interesting. Interesting. So I definitely want to ask you about these ad bans and the the kind of pause period that Meta's put in place. And and because you know, you're one of the, the practitioners that's been sort of hit by this. And I think we've all been reading about it uh, in the media. And so I was reading from one of your previous interviews that the way that you sort of addressed this kind of weak pause before the election in the Biden campaign in 2020 was to essentially just create a bunch of different types of creative so that you could adjust in that last week, kind of depending on what the, the Trump campaign was doing and sort of what type of polling you were getting. So could you describe a bit those ad pauses, how they've affected your work and how you've sort of gone about dealing with them? Yeah. So for anyone unfamiliar, 
in 2020 was the first year that Facebook decided to announce that they weren't going to allow any new ads to run in the final week leading into the election. So in that election cycle, we had already been tracking what Donald Trump was running in every single state on social media. That was the only place that we could actually see that had ad transparency. So the only place where we actually could track and see where Donald Trump was placing ads at the time. Um, and we really wanted to be prepared for anything that Trump put out there in the final week, which, <laughs> as you can imagine, uh, the sky's really the limit <laughs> with that campaign. Uh, so we ended up producing hundreds of different social media ads that we could run depending on different topics that Donald Trump might hit in certain states. And, you know, it also was a lot of work because we had to then set up those hundreds of extra ads on every single state line item, every single audience. So, you know, having to actually go through and traffic all of those ads and make sure that they ran an impression prior to Facebook not allowing it new ads. Aha. Uh -huh. So they had to get at least an impression in order to be sort of viable. Exactly. So interesting, which, you know, also it's like, so you, you have to develop stuff that could be responsive to ads, but not in such a not in such a way that it would be strange for them to run prior to <laughs> to the blackout either. And so from that point on, we basically had teams pulling reports every single morning. I was sent reports by 8 a.m. that updated me on what Trump was running in every single state. And then we would decide whether it was necessary to launch new ads or new messages to respond to any attacks he was putting out there. And of course, we had ongoing messaging during that time that was not related at all to what Trump was doing. We were very good about having a very strong, ongoing, uh, ever-present, broad message, but making sure that if there were things in certain states, like, for example, in Pennsylvania, fracking came up. So we were able to respond to that. We saw in a lot of states that Trump was also saying that Joe Biden would raise people's taxes. So we were able to respond right away and say, Joe Biden will not raise taxes on anyone that makes less than $400,000. So being able to have that ready to go definitely helped us be responsive. But I do think it's also worth saying that when it comes to non-presidential campaigns, it would be nearly impossible for them to pay for hundreds of extra ads to be produced just to be prepared for this Facebook blackout. So I think, you know, just making sure that you're prepared for the stuff that you think is really critical that would be my advice. Like if there's top testing messages that we want to make sure we have ready to go if needed uh, on social media or attacks that we think could be particularly damaging in the final week, just having a response ready to go for those, you know, handful of things could be a good way to be prepared. And then the other consideration, of course, is that like Facebook is not the only platform that, that we can communicate with online. So like worst case scenario, if we're not prepared for something on Facebook in particular, we can obviously message it on other platforms. But being able to combat negative messaging where the opponent is running it obviously has its, its advantages. So I think to the extent that we can be prepared, it's helpful. But then I think I think the last thing just to say on this piece is also just recognizing the limitation of <laughs> how much a new message can really do in a week or less <laughs> to go of a campaign. You know, it does take a lot in order to actually get a new message in front of voters and have it reach them enough times for it to resonate with them and then change their minds. So I think also worth considering, you know, when it's worth it to launch a new message and when it's not and making sure that you actually have enough budget behind that message to, you know, have people actually recall it and change their minds because otherwise it's kind of just a, a waste of money and you're kind of being responsive for no reason. And I think, you know, just to reiterate, we, we were really only responding to things on the Biden campaign with paid advertising that we thought had significant paid advertising on the other side. We didn't respond to every little thing Trump said or every little thing that was out in a press article. It was more so figuring out what are the things that he's actually hitting in specific states online with paid advertising. Yeah, interesting. It's interesting to hear about how the, the sort of effect that blackout would have on, on these, these sort of big level, high resource campaigns. But my last question for you here, we've covered so many topics, my, my head is starting to spin. But <laughs> I'm just curious to hear what is what is one thing that people not involved in digital political advertising might not know or appreciate about the process? Yeah, I'm sure there's there's many things. But the thing that comes to mind for me is, I think, you know, a lot of times people who are 
strategists on the brand side um, are very critical of political advertising. I think they think that it's not as high of quality as, you know, brand advertising is or not as creative as, as maybe they could be if they were the ones writing the ad. But a lot of times when brands, you know, start a creative process, it's like a six month process where they brainstorm about the high level message and then, you know, have like months and months of script writing and then have, you know, a really long shoot and post-production process. And a lot of times the way that, that it looks for us is we get a phone call and say, we need some scripts by tomorrow <laughs> and we need the ad produced in the next 48 hours and we just have to run with it. And so, um, you know, there's a very, very short window a lot of times in the time from when we start scripting an ad to the time that it's live. And I think that that's an important distinction. And then the second piece that is related to that is that, you know, I think a lot of times what is considered a good ad to someone who's like a advertising thinker um, is very different than what is an effective ad to persuade maybe, you know, somebody who's has no college degree in the middle of the country. <laughs> so um, I think making sure that uh, we don't get lost in, you know, making our ads be too tailored to the talking political class and make sure that they actually are produced to be, you know, effective to those who we need to uh, to persuade. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just in, in this conversation, it really is an eye opener to see kind of first, what is the role of, of social media relative to the overall advertising ecosystem? But then also just to see how fast this is moving and how complex it has become is really, uh, it's, it's super impressive to hear about the work that you do. So Megan, thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was great talking to you. I've just been speaking with Megan Clausen, partner at Gambit Strategies. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time, we'll switch over to an academic focus on digital advertising with Professor Sena Krukemeyer about her research investigating the effects of political micro-targeting. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Malmo. See you next time. <laughs>